So when we went to my brother's wedding a few weeks ago, something horrible happened to me. Can you guess what by the picture? Lost my wallet, just got our tax returns, credit card in there, debit card, driver's license, everything. How many of you have ever lost a wallet before? You feel like you lose your life, right? And I was praying, you know, God, you said, seek and you shall find. And we were supposed to go out to eat somewhere, but I held us up looking for the wallet. And I spent an hour, if not more than that, searching everywhere. And I did not find it, and I just began praying, God, what happened to the promise, seek and you shall find, right? And what happened next, I'm going to share at the end of the sermon. The message for today is called The Unbelieving Believer. How many of you are believers? How many of you have ever been tempted to unbelieve? This message is for us, amen? We're going to see what to do in that situation where it's hard to believe in God. And our outline, we're going to learn this from the story of the demon-possessed youth. Are you ready? Let's get into the story. It says in Mark 9, 14, And when he, who is he there? Jesus, when he, Jesus, came to his disciples, he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw a great multitude around them, the scribes doing what? Questioning them. Now, the scribes were the disciples' enemies, so this is not in a good way. They're questioning them. For instance, uh, when my wife and I were barely married and we went to, out to eat with di- uh, at dinner with her family, her parents didn't totally approve of me, and when I was telling her th- parents about our plans to go to college, they just had a thousand questions. They were thinking, how much is the tuition going to be? How are you going to pay your rent? How much are the good books going to be? They had all these questions, and if I didn't know every single one perfectly, they would say, hi, you're unprepared. Thankfully, we're in a better situation now. But this is what the scribes were doing to the disciples. They're questioning them to try to see, can we get them to say the wrong answer and prove him, uh, Jesus, and all the disciples to be deceivers. Now let's keep going. What happened when they saw Jesus? It says, and straight away, all the people, when they beheld him, they were greatly amazed and doing what? Running to him, they saluted him. Now I want to bring out a Bible fact from this verse. No matter what you're going through, you can what? Always come to Jesus for help. Here you see all these people witnessing this fight, and when they see Jesus, what do they do? They run to him. God wants us to know that no matter what you're going through in life, you can always bring it to Jesus. Now, there was one time I was um, canvassing, knocking on the door, trying to sell books, and lo and behold, a little boy opens the door, and there's a glass door, flimsy little glass door that could just break right open. And he's about to open the door, but I didn't want him to. You know why? This guy had a huge, I don't know if it was a pit bull, a Doberman pincher, right there barking, wanting to kill me. And I see the little boy going for the door, no leash on this dog. And I began praying, God, please don't let him open the door. Bring someone out. And right before he was about to open the door, you know what happened? The parents came, hey, 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 don't open that door. And they came outside. I forget if they bought a book or not, but I was just thankful they didn't open the door. (laughs) And so the thing is, you could come to God in any situation. Doesn't matter. The people ran to Jesus, and he wants you to run to him when you're going through trials. Now, what did Jesus do when he saw his enemy? It says here, and he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? Notice here, Jesus is saying, why are you trying to question my disciples when I'm not around? Bible fact here, it says God has your back through how many trials? Every trial. No matter what you're going through, God sees it. No matter what you're going through, God knows it. Growing up in, high, or, uh, in life, actually, it was nice to have a big brother who was a black belt in karate. He was known for being able to beat up people almost twice his age. So if he's in fourth grade, believe it or not, he could beat up a high schooler. This guy was intense. He was supposed to go to the Junior Olympics and eventually the Olympic for karate. And you know what he told me one day? He said, Reuben, if anyone ever messes with you, just let me know and I will tear them up. And you know that did something for me. I was like, I felt amazing. Like, you know, no, and I wasn't picking fights on purpose because I was pretty peaceful in school and everything. But it made me feel good. You know, someone has my back. 
if something beyond me, someone bigger than me comes, I've got someone who cares and will fight for me. And here you see this is what Jesus is doing. He sees his disciples getting ganged up on. He says, why are you talking to my disciples? And he could do the same for us today, man. So now what trial was the father or the main character of the story going through? Here we go. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which has a what? A dumb spirit. What is a dumb spirit? The word dumb here means just one that can't speak. And the spirit here is referring to a demon. So the father is saying, Master, I came, I brought my son who is demon-possessed here. Now it gets even crazier. It says, and wherever this demon takes him, he does what? He tears him and he does what? He foams and he what? Gnashes with his teeth and he does what? Pines away. That word pine just means to just wither away, almost like a dry leaf. When it gets connected, it just starts shriveling up. And he says, this demon is doing this to my son. Have you ever been so angry you just, you feel like you're just going to foam at the mouth? Or you feel like you're so depressed, you feel like your, your life is just withering away? Or have you ever felt so sad that you just feel like your heart is being torn from your body? It's not God who's behind that. It's who? It's the devil. And so here we see, he says, and I spake to thy disciples that they should cast out this devil, but they could not. So now you see when the disciples were there and the scribes were all around them, it was because they were discouraging the disciples even more. How come you can't cast out this devil? So they're on the devil's side. Now it's very interesting here. In life, many times when bad things come our way, we think it's God, right? I remember when I was young, People would tell me the dentist is horrible. They're going to hurt your teeth and everything. How many of you can relate? I remember I have like three cavities and I'm not going to the dentist. And what I realized is they were actually out to help me, right? If I go in there, they could fix all the problems with my teeth, my mouth, everything. But what the world has done is they make you afraid of the one who could help you, right? They make you want to avoid the one that could help you. And in the same way, biblically, what the devil does is he brings a trial in your life. Then he makes it seem like God did this. So now you're staying away from who? Staying away from God, the very one who wants to help you. I want to read this from Desire of Ages, page 427. She gives kind of like an insight of this scene just in first person view. She says, as they went forth strong in faith, the evil spirits had obeyed their word. This is in the past. You know, the, the, the disciples, they used to cast out demons. But look at this new situation. Now in the name of Christ, they commanded the torturing spirit to leave his victim. The disciples are commanding a demon to leave. Now look what happens. But the demon only did what? Mocked them by a fresh display of his power. Now there was a situation that I had been in very similar to this. I'm going to call his name Bob. Because I always get the name mixed up if I try and change it up. But one day I came home from church and I thought about one of my friends, Bob, here. He was in house arrest. He had done something wrong. This guy was very bad. And I was trying to call him. You know, maybe I could read some Bible verses to him, cheer him up. But he was avoiding me. And I said after church one day, I said, you know, what? I'm just going to go to his house and surprise him. And so I go there, and he says, oh, hey, Reuben, how are you doing? I said, good, how are you? And I said, uh, let's go inside. And he said, okay. And he was very happy until we started talking about the Bible. And he said, you know what? Demons, I've been seeing demons, and they warned me that you were coming. And I was thinking, what in the world did I get myself into? And uh, we began talking, and he began to tell me how he's been seeing demons at night. Because this guy was into very bad stuff. And I say, okay. And I said, so do you think you're possessed? And he looked me in the eyes and he said, I know I'm possessed. So as a young Christian in the faith, you know what I did? Tried to do what these disciples did. Put my hand on his head and I prayed one of the most fervent prayers. Saying in the name of Jesus, come out of him. Everything just like the disciples followed their example. And when I opened my eyes, you know what I saw? He looked at me and laughed hysterically. 
and I was thinking, this is crazy. And thank God my brother was there, and we called his parents. And we began praying over this guy, and he begins, you know, I could usually beat this guy up. But when he's like this, this guy became very strong, and I could barely even control him. And we all get him, start praying over him. He start, tries to kill himself. He's getting crazy. And thank God, at the end, he snapped out of that. But what I realized, I asked myself, God, what happened there? I realized I was not really praying a lot. Maybe here and there, I remember, I wasn't really reading the Bible a lot. And, and, and in fact, I could just say my relationship with Jesus wasn't very strong. And so when I go to try and see this demon-possessed man and say, come out of him, do you think that's going to work? In the same way, you see the disciples here, they try and command this demon to come out, and he mocks him with a fresh display of his power. I just want to bring something out here. Without Jesus, we are nothing, amen? Now, what did Jesus tell the Father to do? He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long will I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? And then what does he say next? Bring him unto me. Does Jesus look afraid here? Jesus is not afraid of any demon. I remember one time I was canvassing door to door, and there's something the devil will do. When you're knocking on a door, let's just say you're right here, someone answers the door, they say, I'm not interested, and don't go to that door over there. And you know what pops up in my mind right away? I said, that person's probably going to buy 20 books. I'm going to that house for sure. And in fact, that usually happens. So one day I'm doing this, I knock at a lady's door, and she says, don't go to my neighbor. You know what I think? I'm like, this guy's going to buy all my books right here. And she says, no, I'm serious. Don't go. He's crazy. And I said, oh, okay, okay. You know, I'll, I'll talk nicely. She said, don't, don't even knock on his door. I said, well, I'll feel bad if I skip him, but thank you very much. This time they were telling the truth. I remember I knocked on the door. This guy came out. He looked like an animal. There's barely anything human left in his eyes. Apparently, just drugs had made him crazy. Some of those very hard drugs that will really mess with your mind. And this person said, what do you want? It looked like he's going to throw me off the apartment complex from the second story. So I just give him a little canvas. He said, no, and I just leave. This person was crazy. And you see, this is what happened. Jesus sees this demon-possessed person. He realized, you know, my disciples couldn't cast him out. But Jesus says, bring him to me. You know what that means? Your biggest trial is smaller than God. You, be, you could be going through the worst thing. Think of the worst thing that's ever happened to you in your life that's smaller than God. But the thing is, many times we don't bring it to God. We blame God. Now let's keep going. What happened when the demon came into Jesus' presence? Here it goes. And when they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straight away the spirit did what? It tore him. Not literally, but it's just hurting him, right? And he did what? He fell on the ground and he wallowed doing what? Foaming. Notice here, Jesus says, bring him unto me. And the first thing that happens, this person falls to the ground going crazy. How many of you have ever raised children before? They throw that temper tantrum. I remember one time I told our daughter, come here, Evie. And she just threw herself to the ground. And she got a spanking for this temper tantrum. But the moral of the story is, when they throw themselves to the ground, it's because they don't want to obey you, right? I'm not coming here, Dad. In the same way Jesus says, bring the demon to me, the demon throws the person on the ground saying, you're not going to Jesus. Bible fact, the devil will fight you to the end to keep you from coming to Christ. He'll do everything. He'll put people in your path. He'll put situations in your path. Anything to do to keep you from coming to Jesus, the devil's going to try it. But look at this. Why did Christ allow this in his presence? You know, let me think about this. Let me hide that slide. I used to think, God, why did you allow this horrible display of just wickedness in your presence? But I found this answer from Desire of Ages. I was reading one day, page 428. It says, the boy, now imagine this first person view, okay? The boy was brought, and as the Savior's eyes fell upon him, the evil spirit cast him to the ground in convulsions of agony. He lay wallowing and foaming and rending the air with his unearthly shrieks. Again, the prince of life and the prince 
of the powers of darkness had met on the field of battle. So you remember in the wilderness, right, when Jesus was tempted? Satan and Jesus right there, showdown. Here you see the same thing happening. Angels of light and the hosts of evil angels unseen were pressing near to behold the conflict. For, a, you know, you've seen sports and everything, they crowd around the Superdome. For a moment, Jesus permitted the evil spirit to display his power. Now, the question is why? Look at this. That the beholders might comprehend the what? The deliverance about to be wrought. So Jesus says, let Satan manifest all of his power in this young person's life here. Let him just show it to everybody because that's just going to make the victory even greater. Let me give a Bible fact. The greater the trial you go through, the greater the miracle God can work in your life. Amen to that? You might be thinking, man, this is just, sometimes you think the greater the trial, man, the more cast off I am away from God. The greater the trial, the, the less God loves me, the weaker the Christian I am. That's an opportunity for you to give glory to God and Him to work a miracle in our lives, amen? Let's keep going. What did Jesus have to reveal before working His miracle? And he asked his father, now imagine this, the son's here foaming at the mouth, and Jesus begins to strike up a conversation with him. And he asked the father, how long uh, is it ago since this came in unto him? And he said, of a child. Now that's pretty interesting. Even children can get demon possessed. We've got to guard our children, amen? And oftentimes it has cast him into the fire and the waters to destroy him. But what does that say, those two yellow words? But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Notice he's talking to God. He says, God, if you can help me, then do it. But look what Jesus says. Jesus said to him, if you, it's not about me here. I'm God. He says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. I remember hearing a story. This house, two story, house burning down, two stories. Young little girl at the top story. Her room gets just crashed in. She can't get out. The family evacuates. The father sees her. He says, jump. And instead of the little girl jumping, you know what she did? She started to doubt. She said, I don't want to. I'm afraid. She doesn't know if the father's really going to catch her. And he told her, jump, jump. And the little girl would not jump out of the house. The fire's getting bigger. And finally he says, jump. She would not do it. And she died in the fire. Why? Because she didn't believe her father. In the same exact way, Jesus says, if you really believe me, give your whole life to me. Here's a Bible fact. True faith makes a full commitment to God. If you really believe in God, you've got to make that full commitment to him. And here Jesus says the problems in your life can be solved if you make a full commitment to me. Now let's keep going. What did the man finally do? It says here, and straight away, the father of the child cried out, and he said with tears, Lord, I what? I believe. Help thou my what? Unbelief. You know what that means? He's saying, God, I believe you can save me from my trials, but my own self, I'm a believer, but inside of me is doubt. I want you to take that doubt away from me. So what that tells us is when we believe in God, we can pray the same prayer. Look not to self, but to Christ. Many times we disbelieve God's power to save because we're focused so much on the trial that we're not looking at the one who could save us out of the trial. And let me give a Bible fact. No matter what your past is, God will hear you when you cry out to him. Didn't this father doubt God? He said, if. So right here, this is letting us know no matter what your past has been, God does not care about that. You could be the mafia. You could be a drug dealer. It doesn't matter. If you are determined to give your life to Jesus now and believe in him, he will hear you when you cry out to him. Now, I remember learning. How many of you have ever been to the zoo? We've got like three more slides left. Stay with me. I remember I was at the zoo, and how many of you have ever seen elephants? One time I learned that uh, what they do to keep the, element, the elephants from just breaking out of these places, what they'll do is they'll put a chain in a huge pile of concrete below ground and they'll chain the elephant's foot around it so when the elephant tries to pull itself out it feels that just huge weight and eventually it'll give up trying to pull out its foot so it'll just stay there it'll walk around 
but it'll never try and pull its foot out again. Why? Because it's just, it's had its spirit broken. It's just, hey, I can't get out of here. And so what they'll do is when they move it to a different zoo, they just put a chain around it, no concrete at the bottom, and that elephant will never try to break out. Because the elephant in its own mind imagines there's nothing I could do to get out of this. There's something really heavy down there and it's stronger than me, I can't do it. In the same way, many times we get beat up by the devil. We get thrown down in trials and we begin to think, you know, nothing could get me out of this. But we don't realize there's no trial that could keep us from Jesus. We're just like that elephant. There's nothing. You can pull that ch chain out of the ground. There's nothing keeping you from coming to Jesus. Don't let the devil ever put that in your mind that there's nothing you could do to come to him. Now, let me read this quote here. Desire of Ages 429 says, cast yourself at his feet with the cry, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You can what? Never perish while you do this. Never. If you're willing to say, God, I believe in you, but there's a lot of doubt in my mind, just take the doubt away and help me to believe even more. God will save you. Now let's uh, go to the next slide. Why will Christ always answer this prayer? It says, when Jesus saw the people. So notice this demons here just wallowing. Everyone's watching like, is Jesus really going to do it? It says, when the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge you, come out of him and enter no more into him. Look at this. God puts his own reputation on the line when promising to answer your prayer. So when God, he says, you know, I'm going to answer your prayer no matter what. If he lies, the whole universe sees that, right? So God himself, he says, my own reputation is on the line to answer your cry to me. If you put me to the test in a good way and just trust me and trust me to answer your prayer, my reputation is on the line. I will never let you down. What happened next? It says here, and the spirit did what? Cried. And it did what? And it rent him. And it what? Came out of him. The devil could cry all he wants. But at the end of the day, he's got to listen, right? And he was as one dead in so much as they said he's dead. The devil, oh yeah, so that's what I just said right there. You know, the devil, God's got to, the devil's got to listen to God. It doesn't matter. He could cry, he could ruin your life, whatever. But if you give your life to him, the Bible says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will do what? He'll flee from you. So la I believe last slide here. What was Jesus able to do to the young man? It says here, but Jesus took him by the hand. You know, it doesn't matter what condition you're in. Jesus wants to come close to you, amen? Took him by the hand, and he did what? Lifted him up, and he rose. You know, many times we feel like we're just down in the gutters. We're just nothing. God specializes in lifting people out of those situations. I want to review. God allows trial to come to us all. How many of you here have never had a trial in your life? So that's true, amen? He has the power to help you out of those trials. Have you ever been delivered from something crazy? Any dog experiences? And Satan will do all he can to keep you from coming to Christ. So in reality, you have free will. You feel the pressure to believe in God. You feel the pressure to disbelieve in God. But in the end, none of them could force you. It's up to each individual, what decision will I make? So the last Wallace story. I remember just driving to the vegan restaurant we were going to, just depressed, like, okay, is someone going to steal all my money? And I had gift cards in there and everything. I never carry money. There was money in there that day. I lost it. And I just remember praying, God, I believe you're helping me, but where's the answer to the prayer? We get to the restaurant. My sister works there. She says, hey, Reuben, let me just tell you real quick. I was like, what happened? She said, Mikey, her husband, called and he said, you left your wallet up at my house when you're working out with him. <laughs> I had gone up there to work out. I said, these are too heavy. Let me empty my pockets. Left. I looked everywhere for the wallet. And notice, here I am while I'm doubting God. Oh, God, you said you would, if you seek it, you'll find, ask, and you shall receive. What happened to the prayer here? The whole time God said, just go to the restaurant and I'll answer your prayer. The whole time I was doubting. So what we need to do is just believe, Amen. Because even if you don't see an answer right away, God has set up that answered prayer. So my appeal for all of us today is, will you commit your life fully to Jesus today? There may be some trials in your life. You may be going through tough times. You may just 
be really in the dumps here. But we learn from this story, no one could keep you from coming to Jesus if you want to.